morning. Um, my name is Matthew Lloyd. Um, I run an East London practice and as Rosie said, I'm going to talk about um, some of our key projects and some thoughts about the state of state of architecture. Just to tell you the sort of structure of what I'm going to say, um, I'm going to introduce you to us, the practice and the people. I'm going to then show you a sequence of about five buildings that I think have been significant to us. Um, uh, and then I'm going to talk about um, what I call localism in architecture, but it's actually about um, the nature of small practice in, in, the, in the work that we work with, which isn't domestic architecture, it's public architecture, um, how you procure it and um, what it's like out there. And then at the end, I'm going to show you two more recently completed projects. First thing I've done um, is to just throw some notes around or some ideas about practice to frame the whole um, the whole talk. Um, I'm, I'm quite concerned in this talk with the notion of practice size and whether it really matters. Um, I, 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 um, I reflect that you can't run a practice unless you have a strong business, otherwise you simply go bust. I reflect that um, we are absolutely dependent on our staff. I think sharing out the design is important in a successful practice. I think the personality of the partners creates the practice in every single way. Um, we talk about and concern and are worried about diversity hugely in our profession. Um, doing this kind of talks take, take a certain amount of individual confidence and if you're shy it's hard to do and that reflects on the success of your firm. Um, profile is hugely important to a firm like ours. I think it's important to everybody. Um, again, um, that reflects in me doing this talk today. Um, I think client type focus, we, we are involved in social architecture. We, do not we really don't do any other type of work that and that that kind of shapes us um control who controls how much sharing do you do i've sort of mentioned that already have you got staying power can you keep this going um can you survive the 25 years i'm talking about um can you keep it keep it all going and how is covid 19 going to affect us i think it's going to be really hard for all of us um Publicity and awards, these are essential to a firm like ours. Uh, we try extremely hard to get both those things. Do we have skill? Yes. Do we stay safe from the courts? Absolutely crucial and, and basically probably yes is the answer. Are we risk averse? Yes. Do we love this subject? Absolutely we love this subject and we, I hope and think that the work you're going to see coming um, shows that kind of love. Are we excited by our work? Well, I can say for myself that I'm excited constantly. I'm excited every single day in all the new things we um, produce. Are we honest? Yes, we are never dishonest. Are we, I'm gonna get onto this later, but are we good at this new concept of frameworks, which so desperately affects the way we get work? Well, we are not good at that. Can we do and do we do competitions? Not many, um, unless they're limited. And um, have we screwed it up? Um, not so far. So that's just a little intro, I suppose, to the thoughts of how do you keep it going? This is a selection of some of the images from our work. And uh, there's a couple of things I've prepared um, just to talk about um, the practice itself. Um, I'm just going to kind of read this out, but I'll, 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 I'll keep it going. All architecture firms will be different. It depends on the owners, really, the people who stay the course over years and years. It takes time because architectural practice evolves. It's like going up a ladder, and I've always thought this. You can only win work that's slightly bigger than the work and the type that you've already successfully built. I founded this practice MLA in the early 90s, and I still lead it, and it's named after me. I gained two superb partners along the way who with me are completely committed to the firm, and we're, we're lucky to have that. 
Um, but those partners have significantly different and complementary skills and personalities, and that's absolutely essential also to the way we work. We've employed in 25 years perhaps 50 different architects, um, all of whom have influenced us in various ways. We want our architects to stay with us as long as possible. Um, we adore the talent of the architects. We design through a studio system strictly with constant conversations and crits. We've never been in a uh, market, um, in, uh, we've never had a market position where we could charge high fees, and this has affected our progress. We've got very few support staff. We built this office that I'm sitting in now, um, and that protects us. We never get work unless it's through a competitive process. Um, over the years, we have entered hundreds of competitions and tenders. Uh, so I'd summarize this as saying we've always worked with very little to produce quite a lot. And I'm now gonna introduce you to the practice. I think many of you are in the room practice. Hello, everybody. Um, this is us of today as our four o'clock meeting today. Um, a bit blurry actually, maybe the link didn't work. Um, my partners, Alex and Pat, and then the rest of the firm who are working with us at the moment. Um, even through the whole of the lockdown, we've worked together um, on a daily and hourly basis. I'm going to go back now to um, right back to the mid 90s. And this will interest um, the Architecture Foundation a bit because I, I realized that actually we were in your first book um, of 12 young design practices from 94, 1994. And I think you're on to now, uh, the Architecture Foundation is now on to book number four of this series. Um, and when I look back at the list of the firms that um, I, at that time, was pretty well me and, and a couple of others, were, were, were with, um, it's an amazingly august list. And looking to where all these firms have come 25 years later, some are absolutely enormous and virtually define architecture in this country. Some are world famous. Um, some are, like us, um, prolific and very prolific housing architects. Um, and I think it's fascinating, Architecture Foundation, that you wrote a book where so many of these names um, came out and did good things so many years later. As part of that book, we were asked to design a house, a place to live, and I chose to design a suburban house. Um, sitting on the edges of, of London, actually. I remember, I think, that this was in Cricklewood or somewhere. And much of this little two pages here has influenced the buildings that we've produced. This was a house, I think, for something at that time, like a financier or something. And we overclad this house in a single material. Um, and two or three of our projects have done something very similar to that. So again, I'm incredibly grateful for having done this, this piece of work back then. I'm going to jump now to 1997, um, to a building that was my first public building, i.e. not someone's house. Um, it was set in Brick Lane near our office. We had an office then in Spitalfields. And um, the use of this building was um, is still central to the way we think of as practice. If we're working on a social project with social content, it's picking up from a very, very ragged and very, very hard early 90s. Uh, and the kind of new age of enlightenment, uh, enlightenment arrived with um, Tony Blair. And also, of course, the beginning, therefore, of kind of contemporary architecture, perhaps, as, as, as we have now in the country. I often, and people in the practice will tell you this if you meet them, <laughs> to kind of make up things in my mind about what a place should be like. And it's often Italian and we joke about that. Um, as a kid, the son of an architect, we were dragged around every it Italian city and so on, uh, looking at architecture. And I wanted to make for this homeless scheme a very secure, what I call a Palermo courtyard. And this is it. And we went to photograph it during lockdown. Um, and it's a, it's a housing scheme, as I say, it's called Move On Housing for the Homeless. So you've come straight off the streets. It's run by a wonderful housing association called Providence Row Housing Association, which is a special housing association for homeless. And people move into these tiny studio flats um, into a total secure place, like a little fortress. 
Uh, and when they've spent a year here, they are then moved on to hopefully a permanent flat. So at the time it had a rawness to, for me and it had um, a strength and it was deeply exciting to produce a piece of architecture that had this kind of social content. And from then onwards, actually, I, I and my partners have never really looked back from this type of social content. If you go there now, we took these photos, as I said, in the lockdown, and this is incredible to see Brick Lane totally empty of people. But this building has stood this, this is a quite a busy place now. Um, it's stood the test of time, but it's been attacked with graffiti. And amazingly, the owner, the Housing Association, rather than in a sterile way cleaning it off, has, has actually let this graffiti sit there in this amazing way. And you can see the kind of fortress quality of the architecture. Um, with these strong brick walls and then that, that secure courtyard. And this is the outside of it. It was clustered around a Victorian pub. And as I say, it looks like an old photograph, but this was taken very, very recently. And then amazing to see Brick Lane, to look back on Brick Lane, totally empty. And you can just see our building sitting into the terrace there, um, seamlessly really, uh, and still there today. And now I'm gonna move on to um, 2004. Uh, what were we doing between 1997 and 2004? Well, we were starting here a helicopter outside. <laughs> um, we were starting to um, work for housing associations, uh, which we kind of liked when uh, I'll talk about that a bit later, that kind of use. Um, but we also started to work for churches. Um, and we were one of the early firms, I suppose, of this kind of modern period to work on finding redundant or half redundant or falling down churches. Remember that in the late 90s, early noughties, the East End of London was still massively underdeveloped. There were bomb sites all over the place, underused sites, rubbish sites. And in a sense, we've spent the last kind of, again, you know, these two and a half decades sort of working on these, these pieces of redundancy. So St Paul's Old Ford was, um, in Bethnal Green, a bit further east. This is a photograph from the time. And although it's tremendously busy, if you go there now, actually this bit of Bethnal Green is very similar to this. Uh, it hasn't been gentrified. Um, this is part of Roman Road, I think, or one of those nearby roads. Um, incredibly um, diverse and, as I say, completely really up sort of as it was um, really since the 60s, I think. And this was the church that we um, did things to. Alex, my partner, was, was worked with me incredibly intensely on this. That's the first thing he worked on with me. Um, and we restored a, a not a very good building um, in a period um, in the early noughties when um, the planning authorities in this country were simply more benign. Uh, and we reflect on that a lot that there's a sort of new conservatism that's arrived recently about planning and we were allowed to do things then that um, we don't think that we could do now so this was a semi-derelict building um, the church had actually moved out i can't remember how we got the job i think we took over from another firm um, who didn't who couldn't make it work um, but we our job was to retain the church which we've been doing ever since actually um, and to make enough uses inside it um, to, um, to give it money, actually, and use. Um, I called my little pet name for this one is, you might, it's not terribly original, I admit, but Noah's Ark, and you'll see why in a second. So inside this um, falling down building, we put um, a whole lot of uses that were not religious uses, actually. We put an art gallery, which has since evolved to being other things. We put project rooms, art rooms, and so on, into effectively a boat, a boat or an ark that sat right in the middle of the nave. Again, would, could we do this now? I doubt it. This is a listed building. But at that, that time, in the kind of, as I said, the, the age of enlightenment of that time, planners and English heritage, as it was, were really very much looser and they were sort of trying to get activity going i'm actually wondering in post-covid 19 times whether people will be more experimental and here is this slung arc on steel columns sitting right inside this victorian church and there it is in elevation 
um, as I say, steel columns and a boat. And then, of course, behind that, all the accoutrement of lifts and stairs squeezed into the volume of the Victorian building. Um, we really worked hard on this um, because, partly because the dimensions were so tight, uh, we, we didn't even know if this boat at the time would fit in here. And squeezing it into the time, again, this is kind of um, anarchic actually to historic buildings and we wouldn't be allowed to do this now, but just squeezing the, the structure inside this um, volume was really hard and um, quite a construction project. But in the end, the, the arc is, is still sitting there. Um, and this is a building that I'm pleased to say is massively still visited by, not by the architectural world. We, we tried to submit this for some awards at the time and nobody was interested. Didn't do our confidence very much good, <laughs> but um, we did get it published in one or two magazines, but, um, it was a project that um, really cut new ground. And as I said, people come from all over Europe to see it, not for the architecture, but for the use. Can, what can you do with redundant churches? Um, and inside the gallery, which at one point was a gallery, there's now um, it's been various things, but I think there's a nursery now in there. And this is a picture that's not anything to do with architecture, but it's certainly to do with our project. Um, designing for people is something we've always centered our work around. I'm going to jump now to 2008, just pre-crash. Um, this was actually a commercial building, um, St. Bottles Hall in Spitalfields, um, a small apartment building in a restaurant. This is a photograph from about 2007 before the building was built. You'll probably recognize Spittal Square if you know East London. Uh, there was a huge amount of building at that time, kind of Foster was building buildings and, and others. And there was, a, there was a hole next to a historic, um, not a church actually, but a historic schoolroom. Um, nobody at that time knew what to do with this building or how you could extend it or add another building to it. It was a historic conundrum. There used to be a curate's house, I think, or a schoolhouse. You can see it used to connect here to this brickwork. And nobody knew, what did you do? Do you connect here or do you separate? And we were asked by Hammerson, the client, nice posh client for us at the time, to restore this building and add, a, add an apartment building to the next of it. So um, the plan was, here's the hall, the historic hall. Here is the new apartment building. And we made a, a small link between the two as part of our kind of competition submission. And here's a section through here. So we couldn't build high. This, this little tiny little building sits over um, a basement to another building. But we restored the hall and it became a restaurant that you might go to if you ever felt you were really rich. You could just about get in there once a year if you could afford it. And we built this very, very lightweight building um, next to it. My, my pet name or thoughts on this building was a box of Lego. Um, we had young children at the time and this is one of the models that my son built. Uh, I loved it because I loved its smooth edges. Um, if you think going back to that first architecture foundation model, there were references in there for me. And we took this lightweight building and clad it in terracotta. Now, another thing that's worth saying, well, maybe for another talk one day, is that we tend to go with, um, architects go with materials of the time. Um, there was a timber period, a render period, a terracotta period, and we're now in a brick period, you may have noticed. But at this time, um, this was, a terracotta building that we decided to clad in this this kind of set of stripes and we clad it just as a very very simple box and the impression at the end of it was is very striking it's striking it was striking then and it's pretty striking now if you go down to spitalfields market you can have a look at this building and it's as i say there's no affordable housing because at that time somehow affordable housing had a higher threshold but um, it's, it's a building that there's 14 flats clad in this um, remarkable, I think, um, baguette cladding. The only thing that separates, the, the, the only thing that disrupts this is very clever from an architect in our, our office called Gail White, who's left us now, but was that the white stripes are different and all the other stripes are the same. You've got a wonderful artistic effect. 
And it's particularly um, relevant nights very often. And that is the building at that time, sitting in Spitalfields um, and doing its thing. I'm going to move up a couple, few years. Um, I start to put in with these projects um, periods of time, because when you're working on our kind of projects, they take years sometimes. And the next project I'm going to show you took so many years, it's almost unbelievable. Um, this project took um, at least six years to build, even longer, probably, I'm probably not quite telling the truth there. St. Mary of Eton. It's another church project. It's in East London, down, um, down in Hackney Wick, before Hackney Wick became what it's becoming now, which is a giant kind of housing development. Um, and this was uh, a rather wonderful mission church built by Eton College. Uh, uh, in about 1880, 1890, um, to house and um, protect and uh, minister to, if you like, the poor of East London, which at that time was surrounded by terrace, terraced housing, slum housing, really. And by the early noughties, this, the, the noughties, this building had fallen into significant disrepair. It um, had uh, stolen gutters, water was pouring into it, and it had been trying for years and years to do something that would rescue it and give it enough financial stability to keep it going. And this is something we've done so many times with our firm. But actually, um, what's hard about this project, you've got grade two star listed fabric here, and we had to build only on the church land, which, which was um, a problem. My idea here, or the thing that sits in my head, was San Gimignano Towers, because how do you build so close to a grade two star church building? This is a photograph we took on one of our trips to San Gimignano. Everybody knows that place. And this is a model of this scheme where you can see that we've taken tiny pockets of, of, um, church, of, of church land here and here and here and we've built these tall vertical apartment buildings. We also removed from the um, ownership and maintenance of um, the church, a mission hall at the back, and we turned that into 10 flats. So what we did, we divested the church of its land and sites that it couldn't deal with and couldn't maintain. And a developer built out these new buildings and sold effectively the value of the leases became the necessary um, money to repair the church itself. This is a plan of it, the three buildings, one, two, three, and there's a vicarage building there, and the church sits squarely in the middle. These are some of the, the drawings we did at the time for publicity purposes. And you can see here on this edge along the East Way in Hackney Wick, this, this absolute cliff wall that we created of um, apartment blocks and um, the church itself. And this is the building, well, not, this isn't a recent photo, but it's the building of, re of recent times of the new building. And here, here are the, the buildings that sit. We wrapped this building um, completely in one material, partly as a response to the colors and textures of the original Victorian church architecture but also because actually it was a lovely thing to do. And we were delighted that the developer decided to actually continue with this wrapping all the way around the building. Um, and so wherever you go here, these, this, this chocolate box, this, this Christmas wrapping, whatever you want to call it, um, carries on. And this is the side building that is, even you can see this diamond brickwork pattern disappears into the building itself. I'm now going to um, another church project. It's not the only thing we do, but certainly it's something we do quite often. And look at the range of this project for kind of, if you like, patience for um, the kind of things you have to sit on and wait for. Uh, this literally took 15 years, this building. It's mild May, new church and flats. So close to our office, I could throw a stone from where I'm sitting now to the actual building. Uh, on Hackney Road, very, very busy place. Um, you can't cross this street without virtually getting run over every time. It's pretty grim. Um, I don't think Shoreditch is a place yet that's kind of come of age. And there was this gap site with a 1960s church that's set back here, and you can, can't see that. But this was our site 
to put, again, a brand new church and flats. I've christened this a defended sanctuary. Um, we needed to protect church spaces, um, the courtyard space behind the church from this incredible, intense, constant traffic. Uh, and I likened it to these sort of European um, medieval walls that really you can't penetrate unless you've got the key. Uh, and inside, I'm not going to show you pictures of it, but inside we, we made a chapel. But I really want to concentrate just on the outside skin of the building, which was this long, um, continuous rustic brick face. And we did various drawings at planning of the building. Um, we didn't want the flats to be obvious um, or, or outspoken. We wanted this to be a church building. And we, we, sh we created a large cross on the face and some, some lettering. And we wanted a vast window to signify that uh, if you get into this church, this, this kind of sanctuary, it'll be peaceful inside. The building was eventually built by, um, in partnership with the Housing Association, and it's there today. It, it looks a, perhaps a little sadder than it should. Uh, it needs to be maintained, but it's, it's still a pretty robust building, um, I hope and think, doing its job. It's got housing at the back of it. Um, this is all affordable housing at, at, at low level, and these flats um, really just run into the side of the church. And that's the back of the building, and you can see the back of the chapel. And this is some of the brick detailing that we designed for this. Again, it's a kind of continuous wrap, but it's but it's um, we decided here to to make this rusticated brickwork really because again, just to defend from the the very harsh street. And that's a nice photo of Groff. I'm now going to go to back to stopping sharing. Um, I just want to talk about where the state of the nation, in a sense, you know, my thoughts on for just five five or so minutes. And I'm going to read it again because it's much easier for me. Um, but um, kind of where we are with architecture today, before I move on finally to two other buildings um, that we finished recently. I've, I've, I've called this um, Notes on Procurement versus Art. We here at MLA can be regarded as a local practice. Our projects are within close range of our office, as I've said, rarely straying outwards from our local London boroughs. This gives an undoubted local perspective to our clients and the people who inhabit the buildings we design. But we're also a small practice, nowadays noticeably so. Just a dozen of us at full strength. But today, small is not a mark of success. These days, or at least before lockdown, only big was really seen as any good here in the architectural world, the UK's architectural world. There's something called the AJ100, which some of many of you will know, uh, to list and celebrate the biggest UK practices published coincidentally again this week. We don't even touch the apron of this club. It's an admired group denoting great things. It's celebrated with dinners and awards. It produces um, lots of things. It produces lots of power. And why not? Big practices offer smarter working, better entertaining, more fun, more trips, more conferences, more awards, more CPD, and more kudos. And crucially, I think this is the defining factor. They, they have the ability to win more work, and therefore they become bigger because they've got more resource to do that. Uh, I must link, because it's so much in the heart of what we do, um, the rise of the big practice to the rise of the giant housing association. Mergers in this sector and takeovers are now the norm. The more giant the housing association, the less personal. The housing association movement is in great danger of losing its heart and now reliant on massive outputs procured via policies, not via architectural excellence or the needs of their tenants. Housing associations were founded on the basis of helping local people, but I don't believe that this is their priority anymore. And as for these procurement systems, we don't either in our practice have time or the resource or perhaps the skill, clearly not the skill, to get into frameworks, which is the, the collective of the time for winning work. If we try, frankly, we fail. 
We entered a national housing framework competition recently and came 117th out of 140. And we wasted two weeks doing this work to submit. In the end, it just made us poorer and less powerful. I sometimes wonder if these 140 firms had given this amount of time pro bono for a good cause, then that would have been more useful. I've been to MIPIN, the French property fair, twice. Most recently, I went last year. And this is very relevant around COVID-19. Dining out at an opulent table literally set out on the beach there, the guest of a consultant touting for work. I asked myself, and I ask myself now more, has this simply all gone too far? So we remain, as a practice, local. And thinking about it, why should I presume to work outside my region anyway? What makes me or my firm so good that local architects elsewhere should be usurped when I win work in their districts? Am I a better class of architect? Am I more talented? Am I cheaper? Well, maybe. Do I have um, so many po um, policies promising skills in health and safety, sustainability, anti-bribery? Do I have the right turnover that I will be more reliable than the local practitioner who knows the context, knows the vernacular, the planners, the states, and the local people? And what about our profession itself? Because what I see happening is that the profession is now trending in the kind of very modern era towards two positions, either architecture or business. Um, but can we still do, and, and do we have the resources for meaningful, useful, creative work if we're not also very, very good business people? With fees halved since the good old days of the RIBA guidance for clients on fees, Remember those? Now 20 years old, it's certainly getting harder. So what am I saying here? Why should I keep striving to have a powerful practice? Well, the truth is, anyway, we here at MLA don't really now know how to become more powerful. Perhaps we're too comfortable being what we are, a local firm doing local things. But often I'm caught off guard and I can't help worrying again about size and power. And I remember um, luckily once meeting um, the great Indian architect Charles Career, and I think I see in this group someone who knows or knew Charles Career, so um, I think she'll smile at this. In our conversation he kindly asked me how big my practice is. I nervously admitted that we were 12. His slow and thoughtful reply was, I think eight would perhaps be a better number. And where or where does climate change fit into all this in this post or pre or mid COVID-19 era? Isn't it time for us to slow down and consume less and create within things within our easy reach? Quite frankly, we must. As we lift our heads back above the COVID parapet, the terrors of the climate emergency are right there waiting for us all. We have responsibilities and huge opportunities as architects to do what we can to create the required change through wise specifying and the most efficient design, surely. Perhaps rather than signing up to charters and protocols, let's just hunker down and do the best we can. And remember that small and taking great care is, is, is very useful. COVID-19 um, has seen the world approach the buffers of the end of, we think, 100 years of expansionism. Localism is here now. We, we must create a way ahead, appreciate, stay close, create and consider the best things we can do. The lockdown is proving that to be tr this to be true for many more of us than we would have imagined. And I think, I wonder what people think about that. Architecture, final, my final little point here, and why I call it procurement versus art. Architecture is a time-served profession. You get better at it as you get older. The longer you craft and graft, surely the better your buildings, the more useful and the more relevant. It is later on in life that we will create our best projects. It's so exciting to uniquely, perhaps, be belong to a profession where it gets more exciting as you get old. This subject is a lifelong companion. 
and I hope that when I finally retire, I'm still designing things. My final little point, architecture is many things. It comes back to whether, how you get work really. But it's undoubtedly at the end of the day an art. It is firstly an art in my view. The technology which assists in its creation is yes, important and yes, must be correct, but it doesn't make our subject. We design to improve and create the best places for people to live, experience, work and move through. Aldo van Eyck, the Dutch modernist architect, described architecture as simply built homecoming. And I've remembered that with my partners for many years. I'm gonna share again and finish this talk with two final projects. So I'm leaping forward to 2018 now. Um, and to two housing schemes for Camden Council, which we finished uh, almost at, at the same time. Um, and the, these, these are, uh, I call the first set of buildings are, um, are, are kind of, you know, initial, almost experimental buildings. And these are rather more grown up. They are for Camden Council, the wonderful Camden Council, who have produced wonderful social housing for, for decades. And this is the Bourne Estate um, in Gray's Inn. It is 75 council flats. You'll probably know it on Clerkenwell Road, this wonderful Edwardian um, set of flats. Um, uh, and um, uh, it's been social housing in the borough for, for all that time, for, for 120 years or so. On its southern end, it has two gap sites, one here and one at the back. Uh, there was a 1960s building uh, on the second gap site and we took that down. And there was um, a kind of games area and, we, and, and our client Camden thought that there was a site here to put up some building. This was something called the Community Investment Project of Camden Council. Um, and they are doing a lot of housing again and using the proceeds from these housing projects because they sell some of the flats to reinvest in, in the next housing project. I call this, this is my pet name for this, I call it Naples in London and you'll see why because um, if I go to this slide here, there's an amazing world inside the border state, existing world of balconies and washing and people and incredible density. Um, an incredibly successful estate actually and and this kind of architecture this kind of scale this kind of materiality is incredibly um kind of indicative towards success and these wonderful deck accesses and when we won this competition i think back in 2013 or something like that um the first thing we did was to say we're going to emulate these we're actually we're just going to copy these blocks really in a modern way because they're so successful you get these small deck accesses that um, only supply three or four flats in each case and these wonderful open staircases. They never get smelly because they're not enclosed. Um, they've got gates at the bottom of them, but there's a, just around these decks, there's, there's a, a, an amazing um, social and uh, communal world that we saw from the very beginning of, of when we got to this estate. This is that site I showed you of our block number one. So what we did, we designed um, two, two new blocks, one here on the kind of western side of the southern. You can see here at the top, I forgot to say that the, the north side of the estate is perfectly formed with beautiful little courtyards. And you can go there, by the way, because it's well worth a visit. Forget about our stuff, just go into these courtyards and there's an amazing world of tenements in here. Um, so we built um, block number one on the west and on the south we built um, Block, our block number two. This was mixed tenure housing. Um, as I said, 75 new flats. 50% of these, about 35 flats, were pure social housing, and the other was other the, uh, other half was sold off for private sale to to pay for the, the construction. And we, as I said, you, we our idea was simply to copy the amazing anatomy of of the existing Bourne Estate by making small staircases open to the air that feed onto small deck accesses. In housing, public housing, I think deck access, access is wonderful because 
for a start, it deals with smoke, but it also allows you to, and therefore, sorry, smoke and therefore means of escape. You don't need to enclose these corridors, even at high level, but it allows you to set up a sort of little communities um, between the flats. Um, and of course, contemporary housing does this far better because it's got doors that separate each deck. So you can get, um, as I say, these communities uh, formed beyond um, secure doors. And you can see here, this is one of our planning drawings and um, the way we've locked these buildings, they're not tall buildings at all. They're really of a very similar scale to the existing estate. So this is the existing and this is proposed. And another planning drawing of our block, um, our block two, you can see here our decks, very, very similar to the existing. Never was this, I hope it wasn't anyway, plagiarized architecture from, from history. It was really, an interpretation of, of what we thought was a very successful model. Um, for those of you in the know about this kind of thing, um, we were asked by our client Camden to do detailed drawings, state what we call stage, what are they called now, stage C or stage three drawings before tender. So we really designed the hell out of these buildings before they went out to tender. When they did go to tender, we were lucky enough to then be selected as the architects to actually build the building out. And so this is the finished building. Um, it is uh, an amazing space, actually. The, the interior, of, this is block one. It encloses, um, it finishes off the enclosure of this part of the estate. And we produce a series of play areas inside the courtyard. Um, and we produce decks, um, a contemporary version, as I say, of, of what was there. Uh, in a simple architecture, I mean, it was simpler the architecture um, on the inside than the outside, but we wanted the inside to be really quite simple. Neapolitan is the way I describe it, having been to Naples a few times and seen just the tightness of these courtyards. The amazing thing about this building is the separation distances are tight. And if you go there, you'll see how tight. And the other thing, because this was public sector architecture, our client wanted robust and highly finished interiors. And we were so lucky that um, the client stuck with our design and um, compelled the contractor. And in fact, the contractor did incredibly well to finish all of the staircases and all of the, the kind of common parts in this amazingly um, robust and detailed way. The building now sits in amongst um, the estate itself. Um, we designed great arches, two great arches into the estate. Um, I cheekily, maybe arrogantly, think these were some of the first arches in London, and there are arches in every housing scheme now um, that I've ever seen, at least. So, um, yeah, that was something. And this is looking back from block number two, back into the formed courtyard, um, which our new building had, had enclosed. And this is the very outside of the building, which um, is really a greater reference to the original Edwardian 1905 architecture. Um, and you can see here how we've picked up on colors, uh, lines, colors, and proportions, so that it all fits in. My final project to show you is a building that, um, not how many, I'm not sure how many people know we've done this really, but this is called the Regent Spark Estate. Um, it is just north of Tottenham Court Road. You drive up to Camden on Hampstead Road and there's a wonderful, I think it's wonderful, post-war modernist estate, um, one of Camden's best estates in a way. Uh, HS2 goes through here and we won a competition um, with May Architects, who did a few of the buildings also, um, to literally build infill housing that would then replace the housing blocks that HS2 was or has now knocked down. This is the architecture of the existing estate. My final pet name for this building is a bit weird. It's European apartment buildings by railway stations. It's just something that triggers what I thought these buildings should be because it's a tough place. And I thought that when we built these buildings, they should be pretty robust. This is the estate and our buildings are here and here on Hampstead Road and here and here on Albany Street. And we've got a tiny little building some, somewhere here, yes. And these other buildings are by May Architects. And they're all pretty well finished now. So you can go and see these two. Um, we did two buildings here and I like them, but I'm not going to show them right now because uh, I want to talk about these two buildings, which 
are the ones that somehow I like best. And the funny thing about the office is the office doesn't agree with me, but I like these two very, very defensive buildings. Um, this is a model, a planning model we made of them. Uh, this is our tallest building to date here. I think it's ground plus 10 or maybe 11. Um, and as I said, these are very tight in the fill public housing blocks, replacing demolished blocks elsewhere, uh, sitting hard on this very busy street. And right where my cursor is here is the HS2 station. So right here, there's a giant building site. And people are living in these blocks now. And we wanted them, we knew that for 25 years, they're going to be looking over a giant building site. So we thought we'd give them something to look at. These were the elevations of these two buildings. They are brother and sister buildings, um, identical detailing. They were the heavy lifters of the brief. Um, they provided, they had to be fantastically efficient plans because they had to house a lot of people. This brief here was totally prescribed for us. We were told as an architectural team exactly, not exactly who by name, but exactly how many flats we had to replicate from these demolished blocks. Uh, and we've come up with an architecture that I hope is of its age, but somehow also in terms of color, texture, um, fits in with the estate. And this is these, these, these two particular buildings. Um, they're called something, I don't even know what they're called. Cameron's renamed them, so I don't know what they're called anymore. But um, again, robust, defensive, protective um, winter gardens at the bottom. We made sure, and it was quite a difficult thing to plan, that these buildings would have their living room on each of their corners. There would be, um, the living room would have a corner balcony. And that was, that demanded a real rigor in the planning. This is again, another shot of these two buildings. Uh, and the detailing, uh, very interestingly, for me at least, um, we were not the build out architects. Uh, if you know what I mean for that. We were the architects who monitored the architecture for the borough, but the contractor employed another firm. And actually, you know, they did damn well, in my view. They followed our planning drawings almost to the brick course, well, certainly to the brick course. And the detailing isn't bad. Uh, it's as robust as we wanted it to be. Certainly I wanted it to be. Um, and the two, the buildings really, these are our, our planning drawings. The, the buildings have come out, as you can see, almost identically to our original intentions. So it just shows you don't need to build everything out if you, if I suppose you had good planning drawings. Here's the plan of, of the first building. I talked about um, incredible tight planning. The gross to net of this building is very, very good. It's a staircase, a lift, a lobby, and then we go to four flats that push out to their four edges um, and make uh, corner balconies. So you get marvelous living rooms, living spaces and kitchens, and then, then the bedrooms sit in board. Uh, then this is the taller of the buildings, the one to the north, um, very similar architecture, um, hierarchy. Just to explain why we've got these, this, the, we get duplex flats here. And that's, that's why we've got this, we've inset every second balcony to express that duplex. And again, the plan is, is hard fought. And that's one of these buildings um, looking through the estate back at, back at the building itself. And that's it. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, please post them in the chat. Um, thank you so much for sharing those projects. I think we have a question from Ellis. So I'm going to hand over to him. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I was intrigued particularly by um, your reference to, to this book, the, um, uh, the, the catalogue of the, you know, the, the exhibition that was at the AF. That, and this is the copy that I bought in 1994 when I, when I saw, the, uh, saw that show. And um, I mean, one of the things that's kind of striking about the selection of architects there, I guess, is um, uh, they're, they're quite a diverse bunch. Um, in a sense, it, 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 it does feel like there's a real rupture with the, um, the architecture that was being made in Britain previously. None of them are high-tech architects or postmodern classicists. There's, there's quite a range of positions, but it's, it, it all represents um, something new, I think, in a way that we perhaps 
Uh, I don't know that there's been a moment quite like that subsequently. There's, there's certainly kind of um, tendencies that have emerged, particularly, I guess, this sort of idea of the expanded practice that we've seen in the, you know, the last kind of five, ten years of architects doing things other than, than exclusively making buildings. But I don't feel there's been a kind of kill your father's moment in quite the same way that there was then. And it's sort of interesting to think now, perhaps, as we may be entering another big moment of crisis, um, that um, yeah, you were, began your practice when there was a big recession going on and uh, there, was, there wasn't any work in the early 90s. And that this feels like we're about to enter another moment like that. Do you see that, I mean, what do you think? What would be your, your prophecy of, of what, what we might be looking at in the next few years? And how do you think young architects should respond? Um, I, 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 what's interesting about our firm in, in, in response to that question is we never boomed. Um, we didn't even boom during the boom. Um, we were just too crap or something, or we just didn't, we didn't get it together. So, and indeed, sometimes during a boom, we've actually had a mini recession ourselves. We couldn't find enough work. Um, so uh, my reassurance to young practitioners out there is it's going to be hard because there is going to be a big recession. Um, I can't, it's just going to happen. But I don't know if it's going to be harder than the early 90s when, trust me, in London, there was absolutely nothing to do, which is why I was so excited about that Brick Lane housing scheme, because it was a project, you know. Um, and um, there was then the Great Recession after 2008, uh, nine, when we, again, we didn't really dip much because we had a little bit, but um, because we weren't on a high. And again, coming back to this notion of small is beautiful localism, I don't know what, you know, if it's relevant, but small firms are incredibly robust. Um, I, it's interesting, I was reflecting, I was reflecting earlier, wasn't I, that we've just taken on a small flat to do for someone. I mean, we don't even do this kind of work and we've done it to, um, to, to, to have a month's work. So I, I think, um, if you're tight and small and you and you 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 don't expand too quickly, there's a real chance that this is a great time to do work. Um, possibly spend more time on the projects. I, I'm noticing during the lockdown that we're spending more time um, because, of course, we have to because we don't know what's coming next. We don't even know if we'll have work next, and we're working on some really interesting planning projects. You know, buildings going into planning. And I'm really happy to say that lockdown has given us more time. We're not, we're interested already in survival, Ellis. Um, this is where we're going. We're going to survive and we're going to um, keep all our staff. We, we very much expect, and we're going to spread out the work until some more work comes along. So um, I don't know if that's reassuring or it's a, it's a good answer around um, what's to come. It's going to be hard because values are going to drop. And if values in property drop, then architects are hurt. Um, there's no doubt about that. But, did, but just to come back to that early 90s moment, um, I mean, it feels in retrospect like a moment where a lot of thinking got done during the recession. And it, 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 there was a kind of creative legacy. Do you, was that your experience? Or was it just hard work? You know, that, 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 uh, do you think this could be a creatively fertile moment. I do, uh, but at the same time, I think that all young architects, and I have to say now, even now, actually, I'm far from being a young architect, but experimentalism and newness is so exciting. It's why I love this subject. And frankly, it's why young architects are so excited because anything they do, is wonderful and it's it's a voyage of discovery and why I talked about getting older and, and it getting better. Not trying to reassure anyone, it's just an absolute fact. But when you're in the foothills of architecture, as I was in the early 90s, when there was nothing to do, every competition we entered was a wonderful thing. And I, I don't think it's any different now. Architects are going to enter competitions, young firms are going to enter competitions. The only thing I really got a gripe with is this procurement craziness, which is gonna make it so hard for small firms to say do public housing, 
because they won't have the turnover to do it or whatever they don't have all the things i was talking about that's a gripe with where we're going but experimental small firms innovation this is the time to do it the time to absolutely love doing it so it could be an exciting time ahead thank you um we've got a question from nico i'm just gonna unmute you now okay great you're muted hi there um lovely talk um i was interested in the um, mild May shortage project I had a studio in Perseverance Works which you'll know is just over the road from there it was a kind of outpost of early creative industries in Shoreditch and what the uh, how that scheme was funded because I assume it's some kind of ecclesiastical or church project and what it was that ended up taking so long because I've observed it many times from the 55 bus subsequently and uh, it's an amazing project to walk through and really kind of connects that bit of shortage up really nicely but uh clearly there's a story behind it um well actually there's um it, there's a myth out there that any church has any money i've never met a church that <laughs> had any money um and we all our church kind of rescue projects are, are, are essentially produced via either grant like lottery or via housing a building on church land. The reason why that project took so long is because um, our client had to assemble the land with the hospital behind. And it took dec literally a decade of negotiation to make that deal work. Um, and there was also a, a planning application where there was a tower put on the back of it and that didn't even win an appeal. So we had to redesign it twice. It wasn't our tower, but um, we did the front building. But yeah, that's why it's just just classic one of these land assembly projects that you know and having assembled the land both landowners had to work together to form a consortium and then to choose their architects and and then to build it um, and then then they had to choose the landowners had to choose a development partner and in, in this case it was a housing association so that explains i think the right contracted right. time <laughs> fascinating thank you <laughs> 